How's it going, everybody? All right. So today, we're here to talk about immersion. What is immersion? Immersion is the illusion that you can be present somewhere that you're physically not at. The first examples that we saw of immersion actually happened in the mid-19th century whenever there were murals, there were panoramic murals that were painted that viewers could stand in front of and the images in front of you flooded the entirety of your field of view. And it gave you this sense of actually being present. This example I have up here is at the Battle of Borodino where um, you can go into an art exhibit and you stand in front of it and because of how large and wide it is, it actually feels as if you're on a hill on top of um, the battle area getting to watch what happens. So the significance of immersion is that it's a tool that is very important for how we tell stories. Stories have evolved and the process of telling a story has evolved over time with technology. It initially started with word of mouth, then we had the ability with the, the printing press to be able to, to write and to print books. So we had word of mouth into written text and then from text we were able to make photos and so from photos we were able to take a bunch of photos together to make movies and in the future we'll actually be using storytelling in virtual reality. But at the heart of storytelling is the desire to immerse your audience into the story or the tell, right? So your storyteller is this narrator who's trying to captivate your imagination and focus your attention. In 1838, there's this gentleman by the name of Wheatstone who invented the stereoscope. So the stereoscope was the first attempt and tool that was designed that actually allowed us to see 3D. Wheatstone had discovered that when you take two independent still images and place them in front of each one of your eyes, that your mind's eye actually generates a third version of that photo that allows you to actually portray and represent depth or distance. A few years later, a guy named Brewster came up and made what is known as the lenticular stereoscope, which you see on the right. So this tool is a viewer that allowed people to actually put up to their heads um, the lenticular stereoscope, and they could actually see with 3D um, a different image. So that was the birth of 3D. A hundred years later, a gentleman by the name of Gruber created the Viewmaster. So what's a Viewmaster? Y'all probably don't know about these, but you can ask your parents about them because they were super popular back then, and even when I was growing up. So a Viewmaster is a cardboard disc that actually has 14 different images on it that are in pairs of seven. And those pairs, the disc you put inside of the viewer, and then you have the ability to actually push the button to change what you see, and it's in 3D. So the significance of this is that it's the first time that you as a viewer had the opportunity when someone was telling a story that you could actually change where you were at while that story was being told. This device premiered uh, at the New York World's Fair in 1939. So then we get into computers. 1968 happens. The first computer-aided immersive experience occurs. It's called the Sword of Damocles. It's so large and heavy that you physically can't hold it onto your head. It has to be bolted to a ceiling, and you hold up with your hands the viewer. And as you can see, the view creates a computer-generated graphic that's very, very basic that overlays what you're looking at. And the intention behind this is actually to augment what you see. So this was the first time that we didn't have to have photo stills, right? That we didn't have to have a card that had different experiences on it, but we had this computer that literally had an endless amount of opportunity in what could be visualized or presented in front of us. But at the same time, it also opened up how it was gonna be applied. And so I wanna stop for a second and tell you all this side story about the Sword of Damocles. Has anyone ever heard the tale of the of Sword of Damocles? Yes, no, a lot of interaction here. All right, so the Sword of Damocles is the story of Dionysus, who is a king, who had a follower named Damocles. And Damocles wanted to be the king. So Dionysus was like, all right, man, I'll let you be king. I'll give you the crown and I'll give you the throne. But the day before he did it, he held and put up a large sword above the throne that was held by a single hair from a horsetail. So gives him the crown. Damocles is all excited. 
goes and sits in the throne, and then all of a sudden looks up. It's like, uh, I don't think I want to do this any longer, right? So he got really, really nervous. And he ended up days later actually giving the crown and the throne back to Dionysius. And the reason he did that was because he learned that with great power and fortune also comes potential danger and responsibilities. So I'll tell you why that's important in a little bit, but I want you all to know that because you see what happened after that is 1978 occurs, and there's a guy named Jaron Lanier who's working at a place called Visual Programming Laboratory. And he created the first, and coined the term virtual reality, and actually created the first VR headset. Ironically, it was named the iPhone. And it was spelled E-Y-E-P-H-O-N-E. -E. So we had an iPhone in the 80s before we even had Apple looking at smartphones, right? And simultaneously, this tool, that it was a headset that you put on your face that was run by computers that had colorful graphics and took you into these areas. It also included a glove that allows you to actually reach out and to be able to touch different virtual objects that are in front of you, to be able to interact with things that you've never been able to interact with before. And you might read the news. A couple days ago, Mark Zuckerberg announced that Oculus Rift is going to have a glove, and they're very excited about it, and everyone thinks it's new. Woo! But it actually happened in 1987, right? So, and it was called an iPhone back then, which I think is hilarious. So the reason that things didn't take hold back then was because not everybody had com uh, computers. The computers they had certainly weren't fast enough to be able to operate some of these programs. And they didn't have enough people actually experienced enough with computers to be able to cre create additional content. So that leads us to where we're at today. So today we have billions of dollars that's being invested in the industry Facebook got involved in the last two years by purchasing Oculus Rift for $3.1 billion. PlayStation has a VR headset that's out. HTC Vive has a headset. Samsung Gear allows you to use your phone with a mobile viewer so you can be in VR wherever you'd like. And at the same time, we've also come up with two different types of content. So we have 360 images that you might see whenever you're on Facebook in your feed. Those are the type of images that allow you to actually pan or move around to have a sense of being present somewhere, but you don't have the ability to actually move within that environment, versus virtual reality, which uses game engines to actually simulate you being in an environment. And so you use virtual head-mounted displays or VR headsets like the Oculus Rift or the PlayStation VR headset or the HTC Vive for you to be able to interact or to move within environments or games. Now, the reason this is important is because this is the first time in history that when someone's attempted to tell us a story, that our interaction actually has the ability to change, potentially change the outcome of the story. So how are we using this technology? Right now we have enterprises that are using it for training the military. We have professional sports teams that are using it to train quarterbacks or different people inside of uh, football teams. You have doctors using it for surgeries and pain management. And then you also have consumers who are uh, consuming different pieces of content that are driven by Hollywood and also by the music industry. So everyone's really excited about VR, but we're also really, really nervous because for the past generations of how we've measured effective storytelling means, we don't know how to tell a story yet in VR. So what's different? What's different is, is that the devices that each of you have in your pocket right now has more computing power in it than the computers responsible for taking man to the moon for the very first time. We have smaller processors. We have more powerful displays that can generate more depth and color. We have batteries that are able to last longer and provide a bigger charge of energy. And we also have this thing called the internet, which all of a sudden allowed us to create and connect different pieces of content together and give all of us access to information that we otherwise wouldn't have. But at the same time as the internet came out and enabled us to do this, we also had the ability to start collecting information about engagement. And if we look at the history of storytelling, from the stories that were read to us from word of mouth over a radio, to the images that were depicted to us on side of a television, to the websites and the stories that we read on the internet, there's an industry that's been designed actually to study this measure and measure this, and it's called analytics or audience engagement. So, for example, television, it's all about seeing how many or how large is your audience of people that are viewing. For the internet, it's how many times do people come to your website or click on your YouTube video. Or social media, how many likes on Instagram do you get? 
So the reason this is important is because over time, we have learned that we can tell better stories by measuring how we interact with things. But VR, it's the first time where we actually don't know how people are interacting because we can't see what they're seeing. So it's created this conundrum of where we need to be able to provide more effective advertising opportunities to make stories better, but at the same time, how do we do that without violating your privacy as an end user? How do we, how do we enable brands to be able to tell better stories so you want to buy their products without them knowing all, a bunch of stuff about you that's not necessary and kind of makes them seem rather creepy, if you ask me. So what my company is focused on is actually getting right on the front line of that and developing VR analytics tools that allow us to collect the information that brands and companies need so we can start telling better stories, but at the same time, making sure that your personal information isn't given to them. So this puts us in a spot where we look to you all as the future. I'm, called, I'm a part of what's called the Oregon Trail generation, right? So my generation, we didn't grow up with mobile devices. We, don't, we didn't use them the same way that, all, that you all use them. And it's very, very interesting to me that the way that VR headsets can be generated from the use of phones will be something that in the near future, each of you will be able to access content whenever you'd like. And you'll also be able to create it. So what we need in the future is more socially conscious innovation that comes from people that are your age that have a different understanding of what kind of story do you want to hear? And what kind of advertisement do you want in front of you? Do you want to be able to have somebody sell something to you inside of VR while you're playing a game? Or do you want the fact that you played a game and then later on there's an advertisement that comes to you because you played the game and saw that product? These are all things that you actually have the power to help change for the way that companies like mine do business. Because right now, we don't know the answers, right? And the beauty of this is that this is an opportunity for each of you to actually become an empowered consumer that changes the way that we tell stories. So in conclusion, I hope that some of y'all will explore VR. Feel free to come and, and talk to us at the VR demos that will be going on in the next 20 minutes. And remember that if you want to get involved, to be a responsible storyteller because the power of immersion is the power to bring somebody into a place that they've never been. And that is a very, very incredible opportunity, but with it comes responsibility. So in closing, remember the Sword of Damocles. It's not just a VR headset. It was, it was a, a kind warning to all of us to the remember that with great power and responsibility and the fortune that can come from VR, that we must be cognizant of its dangers. And we should be responsible on how we exercise those powers. Thank you all.